welcome to the Art School Podcast. I'm Ken Goshen. This is one of my favorite episodes ever. It's jam-packed with technical advice for painters, so if you're a student of the craft, this one is for you. Today I'm speaking with Alex Castilla. Alex is an incredibly accomplished experimental physicist, a student of painting, and one of my Patreon supporters. This episode is a mentorship session that I had with Alex. He asked me brilliantly incisive questions about painting, and I did my best to cover them in the most in-depth, nerdy way possible. Alex requested that we make this mentorship session public so that everyone may benefit from it. So you should be thankful to him for the release of this episode. And in the most seamless transition ever, this podcast is also brought to you by the generosity of the rest of my Patreon supporters. They make it possible for me to set aside the time to produce this show. And this month, it has not been easy. I really want to get to the point where I can bring you this show every week, but I need your help to get there. So if you like what I'm doing here, please consider becoming a supporter at patreon.com slash Ken Goshen. $2 supporters have access to all live events and to over 30 hours of video content, which in my opinion is an unbelievable return for $2. But most importantly, my supporters know they are helping me produce free educational content that everyone can enjoy, like this show. And who knows, maybe like Alex, you'll also find your voice featured on this podcast. Alex started by asking me to break down the topic of composition. So let's jump right in. So the first question is, how do you break down? Mm. Uh, I love the, it. The main topics, right? So when we're talking about composition, essentially, the way I see it is that you're, you're indicating that people are having issues with it when they're starting out. But in my estimation, and this might be a hot take, a lot of people are having issues with it being very advanced artists. And the reason for that is I think composition uh, is not looked at for what it really is holistically, which is a system of design, right? When we think about composition in a banal way or in a, in a basic way, people think about composition as the crop. You know, the frame. Oh, you know, my whatever. The ear got cropped out. That's a bad composition or, or something along those lines. But this, this is just kind of level one because essentially to solve that basic problem, all you would need to do is don't crop the ear. You know, <laughs> just put it in the middle of the frame and then theoretically you'd be having an agreeable, uh, agreeable composition. But that's, that's really not how I like to think about it. And you're, you're actually bringing it up in, in, in very good timing because just before we started this conversation, I've been like toiling over a composition that I want to, like I'm just starting this portrait and, and I'm, I'm working with the composition. So the question becomes, how do I do it? Like, let's assume I'm not cropping the ear. So what, what are the things that I'm doing to ensure that, that the composition is good? So the first and most important thing for me when I think about composition is I think about everything that's going to end up communicating something that's narrative, whether it's not a hand, head, hair, shoulder, doesn't really matter what it is. It ends up turning into an abstract player in the equation, right? So a shoulder, if somebody's wearing a, a green, whatever shirt becomes this green triangle, right? It's some kind mm -hmm. of shape that when put in context becomes the shoulder, right? The highlight on the nose before it becomes a highlight on the nose, it's just some pink mark, right? Some pink mark that we mixed on the palette. We put it on the painting. If that mark in isolation, if we were to look at that mark in isolation, nobody would guess, oh, highlight on the nose. It becomes highlight on the nose because of its proximity and, re and relationship to other agents in the frame. So when we are dealing with composition, what we want to be thinking about is how do each of these elements abstractly relate to each other. So do I want this pink mark like on the vertical axis here or should I actually move it? Because this pink mark is very aggressive. You know, it draws a lot of attention. So perhaps we need to make sure that it's closer to the center, right? So essentially what you want to be thinking about is the brain is captured by narratives, captured by meanings, captured by uh, whatever these marks end up representing. But the eye doesn't care the eye gets drawn to marks that have dominant contrast, things that are very light, things that are very dark, things that are very sharp. 
and how are you going to place them all throughout the frame so that the eye is going to have an interesting path through which to travel, right? The eye is going to bounce between the areas of, of, of uh, dominant contrast and linger there for a while. And then what you want to start to think about is, okay, if these are the main areas that the eye is going to look at, what are the secondary areas, areas with slightly less contrast? And these are the moments that when you're in a museum and you're looking at a painting for 10 minutes, and then you suddenly say, oh my God, the earring, I didn't even notice the earring. How beautifully is that earring painted? So how could it be, right? How could it be that it took us a while to, to, to discover the earring? That's compositional mastery. A compositional uh, line of thinking will actually extend the lifespan of the observable window of your painting. You know, your people are going to need to look at it longer in order to really digest and receive all the, all the beautiful elements that you've put into it because they are arranged in a compositional hierarchy, right? Some are very dominant, some are secondary, others are just support. Like for example, backgrounds usually are just support. But what you want to think about is almost like you would think about a composition in another field. Like when you think about composition in music, right? And when you think about composition in music, it's really obvious that in the same time that the guitar has a solo, the bass doesn't have a solo, right? It's this one having a solo or that one having a solo. And you don't even need to be a musician to understand that this is, this is just common sense, right? So if you're a painter, you know, let's say you're looking at whatever, somebody's neck and they have a golden jewel, Okay, so that's playing a solo right there. Perhaps in that same area, I don't want to mess with too much detail in the shirt because they're going to be conflicting. You know, they're going to be conflicting. I have to decide who's playing the solo. And if I want the detail in the shirt to be playing a solo, maybe I don't even want that jewel at all. You know, it hasn't, it's been more than once that I've been painting a model from life and I've excluded some jewelry. You know, I was thinking, okay, great. That person wants to look good for the office you know, hats off to them, right? But it doesn't work in my painting because this golden moment is going to attract a lot of attention in an area of the frame where it's not productive. I don't want to draw too much attention to that area of the frame, right? So essentially thinking about composition is just how do I crop the face or how do I crop the apple? Super basic, you know, that's way, way, way too basic. You want to elevate your thinking to think, okay, I have a frame here whatever it is, rectangle, circle, doesn't matter. I have a frame here and I want the eye to travel in a certain way. Uh, that way is, you know, is, op is open for discussion and with regards to the kind of compositional arrangements that you're interested in. But there's one consensus. You want nobody to be able to like leave the frame, right? You don't want to put things that are going to tempt us to look at the painting next to it. This is almost like a competition for attention. You know, you're at the group show, everybody's paintings on the wall. You want people next to your painting, right? So you need to make sure that it that whatever it is you're you're encrypting in there the route that you're planning for the viewer's eye is not only attractive but also circular that they look at the face the hand the dog face again hand again dog again and that you just kind of can't stop looking away you want to create this kind of visual magnet and usually the the analysis that i use to to drive this point home is the we 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 can call it the the I don't know, 50 meter museum experiment, right? You walk in a museum, you see something from afar and you think, oh my God, what's that? And then you come up close and it's whatever, a rabbit or a mountain or a, it doesn't really matter what it is. Sure. Essentially, we have to understand that we decided to come forth and engage with the painting before we knew the narrative. So what called us to it from a distance? Right. What called us from a distance, what called to us from a distance before we knew it was a rabbit or a mountain is the composition, is the organization of abstract shapes within a frame, the relationships of dark and light, the relationships of the colors. Those have to be attractive way before they become a person or a rabbit or a mountain. They have to call to us from across the room. Uh, and that's a it's a it's this is an elevated way of thinking about composition and if you ask me you know if i want to be inflammatory if i were to say if there's something in the in the current figurative contemporary scene that that i find lacking it's exactly that you know we have a lot of people who can paint very impressively way more impressively than me 
in hitting level that I could never hope to to reach, you know, in their in their uh, specificity with regard to the anatomy of the human body or anything along those lines, I can look at it and say that I'm, 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 I'm blown away, super, super impressed. But compositions are often so flawed. They're so flawed. They look like studies. They look like very, very, very serious studies, very accomplished studies, but not paintings. At the end of the day, for me, really, what sets apart a study from a painting is composition and design because it's, it's not, a lot of people think about it in terms of speed. Like if you did it in two hours, it's a sketch. If you did it in two months, it's a painting, but I don't think so. I think there could be masterpieces done in two hours and really accomplished studies done in, done in two months. And really what sets them apart is what are you thinking about? If you're thinking I'm going to make a frame that people can't stop looking at, doesn't matter how many days it took you or minutes, it's a painting. If you're thinking I'm going to ignore the frame and really focus on how to paint a shoulder. It's a study of a shoulder. By definition, you're studying anatomy, you're studying the human figure, but you're not dealing with what's necessary for us to call this a solid artwork. Absolutely. Does that make yeah, sense? No, I, I, that makes sense. I, I, I agree with that. I think, I, think uh, uh, I like, as you say, there's people that have a, a technique of rendering that is in, uh, impressive, but uh, that that is not the only thing that uh, somebody looks into into when it's trying to find art or or, or visual arts or stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I, I agree. I, I subscribe to you, to your to your idea. The, so then my question is is um, is very basic because this is this is the goal, right? This is what we would like to achieve, and ha- I'm, I'm a I will, I will assume that what you do is you build up to that. So first you start, okay, I'm going to be able to do composition in, uh, in a very simple way without having to have all these layers of, of different paths and different, if I'm doing a study on composition this time, if you, if, if you will. Uh, um, so for example, I, following many of your demos and stuff like that, uh, you are very fond of copying masters, right? Mm. So this is, this is very interesting to me, uh, uh, um, uh, precisely because you, your way of seeing things uh, or, or the things that you're interested in are, are, are uh, very, uh, how you say, um, not so much into the detail of in the rendering things. And many times, maybe by mistake, when we think about the masters, we think about the mastery of the technique of the brush stroke of this thing. Uh, uh, but so my question is, what exactly, because it has to be a big difference between copying a 2D uh, painter, which, which has been already passed through this process of somebody taking the decisions or making a composition and then trying to yourself uh, combine either 3D objects or people or whatever. So what is what are the key things that you think one uh, learns from copying like these uh, already accomplished compositions, right? Mm, that's, such a, that's such a great question. So essentially um, it touches on the benefits that result from from a very close engagement with masterpieces and, and master copies. And the way I think about it is when you, okay, so, and, and specifically in relation to how this contributes to us when we work from life. So when we work from life, the the feeling that, that, that I get uh, is the fact that there are endless possibilities absolutely endless possibilities. You look at any given moment in life, you can zoom in, focus in, you're going to see more information, more information, more information. And the problem with that is that it's just very tempting to chase after everything and get swept away by the degree to which, you know, there's infinity when you look at life and you are as a physicist should, should, should kind of find this term endearing. I assume there is infinite an infinity of information in life and no painting can, can support the weight of an infinity of information. So, so you need to learn to edit. You need, the, you know, when you're working from life, the struggle is not how do I paint what's there? The struggle is how do I not paint 
all the stuff that's Absolutely. there. You can you can only paint around what? Like 20%, 20% of what you see. You see an endless number. Like we could sit here for for seven years and I could try to copy this chair that's next to me. Every tiny little fiber of the chair. And, you know, the more fibers I put in, the painting is not improving, right? So the, the question becomes, what do I focus on? What, what warrants my attention and what can be left out? And the engagement with, with master copies really helps us understand this process of editing. You know, we look at a Velasquez and you look at the shadow that Velasquez paints and you're like, that's a very simple mark. He didn't put all the tiny little hairs of the beard in the shadow. I wonder. Is this Velasquez's personal taste or is this something that recurs? And then you look at Rembrandt and it's there. And you look at Rubens and it's there. And you look at, uh, you just keep mm -hmm. on seeing these things. And of course, these, these will be different for every person depending on, on the collection of masters that they appreciate, right? Like if I like Rubens and Velasquez and, and Rembrandt and Caravaggio, there, there are themes that recur in their work that once you really engage with them closely, you start to understand, okay, this, this pattern keeps on leading to results that I find aesthetically pleasing. Uh, mm -hmm. And it helps you understand, okay, if I saw it here, 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 maybe I should adopt it. And then you run into it when you look at life. You look at life and you're thinking, man, that shadow has so much information. But if Rembrandt was here, he'd paint it simple. What would Velasquez do? Velasquez would also paint it simple. What would Rubens do? Oh, Rubens would paint it simple. And so they become kind of like your, your database of solutions to complex problems because life, life just throws all the complexity at you mercilessly. But if you have a backup, you have the backup of all, of all your master studies that you've done, you can kind of, under, you can kind of ask yourself, if, if Degas was here in my chair instead of me, how would he approach this? Because he certainly wouldn't paint all the information that I'm confronted with. He would do a very rigorous process of editing. And, and because I've studied Degas so closely, I can, I can kind of get into his head and understand, okay, he would focus here. All that he would say is insignificant. So I can allow myself to do that. Um, and what becomes the most interesting, I think, from... Uh, uh, a very, very close observation of art history is that you start being at liberty to make combinations in your work between artists that disagree, right? So for example, when I paint my breads, right? Uh, I have this fan, I have this, uh, to, to, to those of you listening in the future, uh, at, some, at, some, <laughs> at some point around 2020, 2021, I was uh, still very infatuated with, with uh, painting bread. And something that I really like about it is, is actually the contrast of paint application that is that is um, a great opportunity between the outside of the bread being very smooth and shimmery and, and glossy and the inside of the bread uh, looking so, I guess you could say, stringy, almost fibrous, glutinous, whatever that is. And for me, it makes perfect sense to use a completely different scheme of paint application to capture these two sides of the same coin. So when you're asking about the in part, the inner parts of the bread, the way I like to paint them, I think, what would Rembrandt do? Of course, I don't come close to Rembrandt. I never will, but he's my inspiration for that. I'm thinking thick paint, impasto, make that texture work for you. But then on the outside of the bread, I'm thinking much more like a French academician, like Ang or Jacques-Louis David, very smooth, very glossy, make it look like somebody just coated it with oil and it's just like shimmering. So these, these two painterly traditions don't necessarily connect, not geographically, not chronologically. You know, these are people who never met each other and never spoke the same language. But for me, these are two really interesting uh, approaches to representational um, qualities and how to render form and how to mix colors even. And if I can mix them, these two contradictory approaches in one artwork, then I think I'm making something original. You know, these, so, so at, the, at, at the highest level, your engagement with these, with these old masters, they become like tools in your arsenal. You're thinking like, this is an area I want to paint like Degas would, but this is an area I want to paint like Da Vinci would. 
can I combine them to look like they're intrinsically connected? Like they're not distant by geography and, and, and time, but rather that they could coexist. Uh, then you're making a new style happen uh, that people who are heavily, you know, steep in the, in, 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 in the realism scene can identify, okay, that's, I've never seen that combination before. Of course, to people who are coming from outside, they can all come and insult us by saying it looks like a photograph or whatever it is they choose to say when they try to make us happy. But, um, but in fact, I think that's, that's, a, that's a mature way to start building on your own style. There's, there's a paradox there of the more, the more rigorous you are in copying your sources of inspiration and the more numerous your sources of inspiration are, the more you can pull from these different personalities, solutions that are relevant to your own work. Therefore, you make your, your work like a unique cocktail of other people's techniques that wouldn't have necessarily worked in conjunction with each other if it weren't for your adoration of, of these different things and, and, and creative way of putting them together. Uh, and, and, and the last analogy that I, that I usually like to use to kind of drive this point home is Think about life with its infinite possibilities as walking down the aisles of a supermarket. If you just walk down the aisle of a supermarket, most people, you know, would spend their monthly salary trying to purchase everything and end up with a basket that, that delivers no dish, right? You're not gonna, you're not gonna accidentally create a great cake if you purchase everything in the supermarket. Right. If you if you if you want if you want to if you want to make a good cake, you need to write the recipe in advance, go to the supermarket, think I need 12 ingredients and not get distracted. You're like chocolate. I need that flour. I need that sugar. I need that strawberries. Very tempting, but I don't need it. Strawberries would be the golden jewel that is bad for my composition. Right. I don't. It's a nice item for another day. But in this chocolate cake, it doesn't work. So familiar, familiarizing yourself with the old masters is like having a recipe book. This is how you could make a good portrait. I can go to this piece of life here that's right in front of me, which is where I sit my models. And I think today I'm going to take a note out of the Velasquez book of recipes. Today I'm going to take some, something from the Degas book of recipes. So for Degas recipe, we need this kind of light color with some bluish tendencies and we need to bump it up against this dark orange that's like the diga recipe we can use that uh and so re, re like taking the time to be intimately familiar with your sources of inspiration helps you make paintings out of the infinite possibilities of life and and and, and stop you from chasing the, the chasing infinity is not lead, gonna lead you anywhere sure Sure. No, this is this is this makes sense, total sense, uh, and uh, it works very well because then it brings me to 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 another question, which is uh, discipline, right? Mm. So, <laughs> discipline in the sense of uh, uh, not not so much in the sense of being rigorous, which is also good, and and it, especially in this type of craft, it's it's a very manual. Uh, 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 craft uh, uh, so it takes time to 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 and discipline to 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 get those tools that you that you would like as i guess you agree with me that no you don't need all the tools depends on what tools you like to work so you need eventually to make a, cho a choice of of what kind of art or what are the things that you're looking for and it doesn't have to be the same for everybody but my 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 when i refer to discipline it's more in the sense of not taking the strawberry that day. So uh, in the sense of saying, hold on, uh, uh, don't try to be too specific or don't try to over render something if it doesn't add anything to the, to the narrative, right? So mm. sometimes this, this extra information brings nothing as you, you were saying, but obviously this thing doesn't come naturally, I will think, at least not for me, if somebody has this uh, as a natural trade, it's good for them. But I'm assuming always you want to, oh, there is an eye there, right? Uh, okay, let's try to, to, to render it or let's try to put it there so it looks like an eye. So you need to exercise your self-control 
So how, how do you reach that point? Because it's extremely difficult. This is one of the things, for example, I struggle the most uh, uh, trying to uh, improve little by little, but I see all, my, all the time going and then essentially wasting my time because mm. I'm trying and focusing on something that is not important and then everything else falls. I like so, it. So, so it's so a, it's a, you have. If if I were to understand what you mean, because I think I think discipline is a very very broad topic, but you mean specifically yeah. discipline in terms of how do I make sure that I'm implementing editing in my work yes. uh, as opposed to being swept by all the infinite possibilities? Is what you mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the the, the ability of simplify of, of force yourself to try to simplify as much as you mm. can. And then by levels go, going mm. more specific. But, I like uh, that. So this, this is something I struggle with, for example, and I'm sure many people do. Yeah, this is extraordinarily common, and I feel like there's a there's an intrinsic conflict here between whether or not you want your work to be compelling, deep, emotional, or whether or not you want your work to be impressive. Right. Sometimes it, in the work of the masters, these two things come together. You know, they're both emotional, compelling, memorable, and also impressive. But at the beginning, there's a little bit of a contrast between before you're able to synthesize these two things. If you go too much in the direction of wanting to be impressive, then you're going to fall into that trap. Of Absolutely. wanting to render everything because it's an it's an ego driven thing, right? Because you think, oh, I want to prove that I can put all the details of the fingernail and every little part of their beard and and all the little highlights on the eye. This is this is almost like people who are naturally disciplined. They fall into this trap because they they're gonna feel like if I didn't put it in, then I gave up on it. You know, then then that that little detail would have defeated me. So it's, it's almost like this ego driven activity. I'm going to capture everything like, a, you know, it's, it, it doesn't come from the same place that good artwork springs from. And I think this is, this is really, it takes a lot of maturity and, and, and wisdom to ask yourself as an artist, what makes an artwork good? What makes an artwork good? And it doesn't even have to be visual arts. It could be music. You know, you don't want a song with all the chords, right? Sometimes yeah. magical songs like Knocking on Heaven's Door, three chords. Sometimes there is a fourth in the Guns N' Roses version and in, uh, in the Bob Dylan version, but then Guns N' Roses took it out. But three, four chords, that's it. If they're very, very, very good, then it's enough, right? It's this idea of less is more. Less is more is... is throughout cultural history, whether it be arts or music or dance or whatever you want, the simplest things that are arranged correctly are the ones we remember forever. And I think this maturity can start to develop if we turn our discipline against it in a way that asks ourselves, okay, I'm making a painting, right? And I, as, a, as, a, as an artist, am attracted to certain kinds of work. Now, what makes those works good, in my view, is something that you have to ask. You know, if you're, if you're infatuated with the work of Van Dyck, as I am, it's not enough to stand there and say, oh, it's beautiful, and I don't know why. That's, that's just, you know, it doesn't serve. It doesn't... It doesn't put you in a, in, a, in a right mindset, in a right position to then create these kinds of stunning works yourself. But if you start to investigate why you like the works of, of Van Dyck, it's most likely not going to be for the reason that Van Dyck painted everything. Because a close, a close examination of Van Dyck is going to prove that Van Dyck actually didn't paint everything at all. He painted a few very simple things, well positioned in the frame, and left it left it, you know, let it go. And especially, you know, when we're talking about Rembrandt with Rembrandt, there's the classic way of looking at, at a Rembrandt that from a distance you would think, oh my God, all the detail in that metallic armor are going to blow me away. And then you walk up close, no armor, no detail, no nothing, just some 
like splattered calligraphy of thick paint inside of a sea of shadow and you understand oh my god like i've imagined this whole thing so rembrandt is actually engaging my imagination uh and and implementing this principle of less is more um so from a close analysis of the kinds of paintings that you like you might be persuaded to follow their approach in in actually focusing on what matters and and leaving extraneous details out now if you're a fan of people like uh like i don't know who to name in this in this regard like um chuck close or all these like hyper realist painters who are you know actually committed to painting every single hair and Chuck Lowe's I'm, 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 I'm naming him because I actually quite like some of his work. So mm-hmm. I don't feel too bad, but there are others whom we shall not name because like, I dislike their work sure. greatly. But if that is the kind of artistic tradition that you like, then by all means paint everything, you know, that's, 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 that's what these people believe in. That's what they think is, is good. But I ask you to think when you look at these paintings and you're stricken by them, are you stricken because they're beautiful or are you stricken because they're impressive? I think it's almost always because they're impressive. You look, oh my God, he painted the car and the reflection in the car. You can see all the street and all the street lights and everything is reflected in the car. Okay, very impressed. Now what? Like, now what? I'm not, it doesn't touch me emotionally in any way, right? So it really does require um, understanding what it is that made the greats great and seeing that if it recurs, um, then this is not an argument from authority. It's, it's literally like the, the preponderance of evidence shows that, that, this is, that this is the way to go. Now, I want to give a pitch for it that is, that is slightly more uh, humanistic. Um, okay. If we take the example of the Rembrandt armor that is merely hinted at but never fully rendered. And both of us, we're hanging out, we're in the museum, we're looking at a Rembrandt. Both of us saw that hint and imagined armor. In my view, there's a really cool thing that happens because he technically didn't paint an armor and we technically didn't see an armor. So if both of us understood armor, it means we both kind of saw it a little bit differently. We fill in the gap in our own imagination that the painter has left for us So essentially, the work is being finished in our head. (laughs) Now, what is that akin to? That is akin to great rhetoric. In great rhetoric, you don't appreciate being spoon-fed all the bits of information. When somebody is a fantastic rhetorician, they're going to say a sentence and the whole paragraph is going to be completed in your head. This is a great form of persuasion because you make the audience feel like they're with you in constructing this argument. They're with you every step of the way. So when I look at a Rembrandt, I almost feel like he left it a little unfinished for me to finish in mm-hmm. my mind. And when I'm finishing it in my mind, of course, I'm going to finish it to the, the, the finest elements of my taste, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to look like the best possible armor because... Nothing beats the way an armor could look like in my imagination. So actually the painting becomes open for every individual to imagine that armor slightly differently, completed in their mind as their own fantasy, best armor that ever was. And you're not, because you're not spoon-fed information, you feel like your engagement with the piece is far deeper. Hyper-realist work that renders everything is a completely opaque you know, uh, screen that sure. you can't, you can't act. I, I feel like I have nothing to give to the piece. You know, I, 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 I stand there and I'm just, I'm just disappointed with the fact that I'm being spoon fed everything. Uh, there's no room for me to engage. Uh, and it's a bummer, right? So I think tapping into that feeling of what a bummer it is that this person decided to paint every little wheat in the wheat field i'm thinking of a specific painter with every little detail of the wheat field instead of doing what van gogh or what monet did using the beauty of paint and simplicity so that when i look at it from a distance i feel the wheat field i feel it and and that lets me have a role i have a role to play you know it this is a this is a piece that demands a human audience 
It's a piece that isn't complete until another human comes and looks at it. You know, a hyper-realist piece, you could put it in the closet and close the door. It's already complete. It doesn't need human eyes to finish yeah. it. Uh, and I think it, it's a much more human way to make art, to edit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think, I think it also had, has something to do of, uh, of your relation with, with the sense of audience, right? So the spectator. So it's a little bit of um, uh, knowing that your, the, your audience or the, whoever is going to see is smart enough to fill in the gaps or to... I wouldn't say smart enough. I actually would... would... This, this again is another inflammatory statement, but I think we're built in with this stuff. I think that's what makes painting a primordial desire of the human race. You know, we've been painting on caves for tens of thousands of years. And these initial sketches of, of bisons and lions, they don't look anything like a bison. They don't look anything like a lion. So how can we, 50,000 years into the future, they just found one that's like 50,000 years old, something wild. But even if we go to the, to the French caves, you know, 20,000 years ago, how can we look at it and say, hey, bison, it's sure. crazy, right? Because we, we, we are completely disconnected in time. All the stuff we knew th that we've learned since these, these, these primordial ancestors of ours, and yet these very simple few lines this bison is like, i've studied it very closely it's no more than like like 17 lines it's a very very simple arrangement and yet everybody in the human race would look at it and go somewhere between bison and cow doesn't matter if they speak hebrew doesn't matter if they speak spanish doesn't matter if they speak chinese there is there is there is an ancient part of our brain that communicates And, and deciphers images and activating that part of our brain brings us in direct contact with what it means to be a person. You know, you put a cat there, they're not going to see a bison. You put a bison there, they're not going to see a bison, right? So Absolutely. these kinds of artworks, are act they actually make us feel human because this is a human tendency to look at art and fill in the gaps. And we want to turn on that part of, our, of, of the brain. You want to make somebody stand in front of your painting and feel like they are human that's the kind of power that art has and so if you fill in all the gaps you're not enabling your your audience to have this trans transcendent experience absolutely absolutely no this is this is this is very interesting in, in, in general because as you say it's a, it's a human condition um uh, uh, that we appeal to and then this is always this question why, why do we do this right like uh, what people have been doing this and why we keep looking at things that are some of them hundreds or thousands of years old and still uh, tell us something mm. as you say uh, relate make us relate to this the, these things is, is extremely interesting and unambiguous um, and unambiguously so you look at that thing and you you're not wondering oh what are these connections like what are these collection of lines this is a very mysterious whatever de Kooning compass you're not here's a bison being chased by a lion it's so clear and to think about how amazing it is at least for me there are some languages that we have like for example the i think they're called the phoenicians they had the few languages that we still haven't discovered you know how to decode them there's no rosetta stone for them yet so we have the text but we don't know what they are saying uh and and this this could have this could give us insight into their culture and who they were as 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 people and yet we have this subterranean kind of communication the image world where language is completely unnecessary. Who knows what language these cave people were speaking? But because they were engaged in image making, we are so competent at deciphering these images, no, no matter how close to abstraction they go, that we immediately understand so much about their lifestyles, so much about their ambitions is being communicated through this simple arrangement of lines. It's absolute magic. And it's magic that we have embedded in our brains to be able to decipher it. Like how difficult would it be for me to even learn to say the sentence, the bison is chased by lions in their language. 
it would be a, it would be a challenge like nobody knows what how that might have sounded like but luckily they've inscribed it in a language that we all understand the language of the image absolutely yeah no this is super interesting uh, 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 I want to roll back a little bit to, 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 to the to the some of the topics we were discussing in terms of um, uh, uh, learning or, or pushing ourselves towards these specific goals and how we break down different things and it's very curious to me because uh, I've been thinking about uh, these uh, limited pal palette uh, uh, exercises that mm -hmm. um, that many people suggest that are, that are good for, for that precisely to give you not so many options uh, uh, so you can find a way to resolve uh, just the necessary. It doesn't have to go beyond that. It's very curious because you uploaded recently something that you were doing with pastels that I found pre precisely on top uh, uh, of, the, of, this, uh, of this point. So I want, if you don't mind, just to tell me a little bit more of your, um, your opinion on making ourselves doing this type of exercises, whether it is restricting ourselves to a palette or to a media or to a size or mm. to a time, like there are many variants that one can, can do and you have explored some of them in, 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 mm. in your teachings and say, so if you can just feed me or, or, or feed everybody with a little bit more of, uh, uh, of this, uh, uh, your oh, take on this thing. Absolutely, absolutely. My God, this is a huge topic. There, so there's the topic of restriction in general, of making sure that uh, whatever it is we do falls within some kind of focused parameter, and and that that is a big topic. So let's let's kind of try to dive into a few specific parts of of that very very big umbrella topic. Uh, let's take for example limited palettes. So what do limited palettes? have to offer for us. And for me, the main thing that, that, that a limited palette is meant to teach us is exactly the, the, the thing that I said before, you can't capture everything. You can't capture everything. So what you need to do is focus on what can I capture and how can I set it into balance? And the crazy thing about it is this, right? So Let's say I give somebody a pencil. Most people are most familiar with pencil. We kind of start drawing with pencils because that's what we have at school. People feel at home with pencil. And I say to that person, you know, here, draw this apple with, with a pencil or this portrait with a pencil. People would not feel limited. They, this would not feel to them like a limited palette. They would feel, oh my God, I can do everything. I have a pencil. That's great. Then you take them into oil and you tell them, okay, you have white, green, and red do this portrait and they're like oh my god i can't this is this is so limited well it's crazy because it's infinitely richer than the pencil infinitely richer than the pencil and yet it feels like a limitation so there's there's a strong dissonance here uh and 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 it it it's like there's a myth that as soon as you start working with with color then we fall into the strap immediately of we have to explain and render everything that's out there, right? Uh, but if it was pencil and the apple was green, we had two, two apples, one green, one red, one next to each other. As a pencil artist, you immediately know, I don't care. You know, I can't, I can't express this difference between the green and the red. So let me focus on the things that I can express in order to make this drawing beautiful. Nobody would like, quit on me and say, I can't draw these apple with the pencil because, you know, it's way too limited. And I'm, I'm only interested in expressing every possible bit of information that I see in front of me. And otherwise I'm like leaving. And then all pencil artists will quit the medium forever. This is, this is a silly way to think, right? So a limited palette essentially teaches us that you need to focus on what can be captured, not on what can't be. And that gets elevated when you start to think and understand that even a full palette with 20 colors is still limited. It's all still limited unless we construct the palette the size of America and put every possible pigment on like, and, and it's not gonna give you, it's not gonna give you better artworks, you know? So the, the idea of a limited palette, when you really, really explore it, 
makes you feel that even when you put all the pigments that you want on your palette, you still look at the world and know, I can't capture everything. Nobody can. So what is it that matters? What is it that I need to capture for this painting to work? And I know of no better teacher than the limited palette paradigm to understand, you know, when, you, when you're looking at that pastel thing, right? So if there were things in the original that were a bright purple, I would have had to give up on them. You know, it's like, okay, well, these we're going to either call red <laughs> or we're going to call them gray and it's going to be my artistic decision. But currently I, I can't, I can't capture them. You run into those every day when you're working with a full palette too, you're looking at life and you're thinking, okay, like I can't, this oil paint can't capture all of these tiny little details without my painting falling apart or this value differentiation without my painting falling apart. So you need to come at life understanding that oil paint is a humble medium. It's just some colorful powder mixed into some glue and that's it. And it can't capture everything. And knowing that you're able to capture it in three colors and that you're able to capture it in four colors, then when I give you 10 colors, you feel luxury. You should feel, oh my God, despite the fact that I'm, I'm dealing with, with, a, with a medium that is, you know, it's explicit poverty. This medium doesn't, it can't do that much. You know, What's, what it's going to do when it does something well is not because of how prestigious and amazing the, the, the material is, but rather because we know to focus on the things that it can do, play to its strength and put everything in balance, play to the medium strength. And, and it's, that's what I think um, limited palettes are best tailored for. And to really, you know, expose the absurdity that people don't feel limited when they have a pencil and then they feel limited when they have three pigments. It's, it's madness, right? So we have, to, sure. we have to build a bridge. We have to build a bridge from, from pencil, which is where everybody feels comfortable and not at all limited, and then add things and, 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 and just confront and combat the feeling of poverty in your medium, you know, uh, the feeling of, of limitation, because essentially it's not that limited palettes are limited. It's that every palette is limited when confronted with the, with the endlessness of life and, and, and uh, the infinite nature of it. So that's, that's just, for me, that's super important. Now, if we can talk about another kind of limitation, limitation of time, the limitation of time is huge for me because, uh, and specifically, I'm, I'm assuming that you're mentioning it because you, you may have seen a few of my, uh, my favorite exercise of like timing yourself for 15 minutes uh, to, 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 get, to get a charcoal sketch down. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. The reason that I like implementing that, and, and to be honest, you know, the things that I, they, that I put online with the 15 minutes can be more radical, can be 10, can be five, can be three. And I've, and I've done these. And the reason that I believe so strongly in that exercise and in limiting uh, the amount of time that you have is because my overarching thesis is the brain is constantly interfering with the way the eye is the eye and the hand are trying to dance. You know, the eye sees the world as an abstract field of endless possibilities. Think about it like if somebody who was blind all their lives suddenly got the gift of sight, they would see, you know, oh my God, all these colors and shapes and this, this, this whole insane um, sensory experience, it would take time for them to be able to decipher it with all the tools that the, 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 the brain is constantly um, coming up with. And this, the, the, this thing that the brain does takes a little bit of time. So the more we speed up the process, the more we have a chance to leave the brain behind and focus on the visual. The more stressed we are, the more we learn to, to tap into this primordial part of our brain that operates on reflex and operates on instinct. And sometimes people say to me, how can you just eyeball it? How can you just measure it with your eye? And this 
is an absolute like the 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 amount of 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 disrespect that these people have to our most valuable gift from evolution you know this eye has evolved over tens of like millions of years to become what if not an unbelievably precise measuring device this is is a very precise measuring device and to the listeners I'm pointing to my eye as you might expect um, and the, the the way that I like to to prove it is the moment when I hope most people have had this opportunity a cup of water falls off the table and you catch it in midair who taught you to do that who taught any of us to do that this has never been taught to us at school and it, it's not something that if you you Think about it long enough. Let me strategize how I'm going to catch the glass when it falls. Nobody can strategize that. You know, it's, a, it's, it's faith. It's faith in the, in the intrinsic accuracy of our vision and the accuracy of our muscles. We are better at these things than we think we are. We have a low opinion of our God-given tools, evolution-given tools, Uh, and we need to learn to use them. And what teaches us to use them, I think, is time pressure. When we, when we get into the fight or flight mode, the eye starts developing superpowers and the hand starts developing superpowers because that's what evolution has prepared us for. When we are stressed, when a lion is chasing us, that's when we become strongest. That's when we become fastest. That's where we become the most accurate. So continuously putting yourself under the stress of time, I find... taps into a lot of biological mechanisms that we're not used to activating in our leisurely day-to-day life, but these biological mechanism of precision, undeniable and unequivocal precision, uh, we need it. We need that precision to be good artists. And the best way to kind of find our root back into our ancestral gifts is Is to stress ourselves out there's that it doesn't work if you're not stressed because if you think you have all the time in the world you'll just take out the ruler and start you know leisurely that that's that's nice and all that's great but it's not it's not everything you can you can teach yourself to be way better way more direct way more precise but unfortunately there's no way to do that without stressing yourself out tremendously so it's it's that that's what I'm trying to do with the limitation of time I really want to put us in the fight or flight mode to see how precise the eye really is to see how precise the hand really is and the eye and the hand are very precise follow you know re-referring to the catching of the of the water glass example now another limitation that we have is the limitation of size. Which you brought up and what can we learn from the limitation of size the limitation of size teaches us the thing that we were talking about before what is going to make a painting work right if we have something that's this small it's not going to rise and fall by whether or not we've painted the eyelashes it's not going to rise and fall by whether or not we've painted the fingernails it's not going to rise and fall by whether or not we've depicted every little um you Uh, fold in the fabric, right? So the smaller the painting becomes, the more it's going to rise and fall based on design, based on composition, and based on simplicity. So if you're someone that has a difficult time letting go of all the tiny little details, make your painting so small that it is impossible to capture them. And when it's that small, when it's impossible to capture all the details, all you're going to be left with is How can I make this frame interesting by correctly arranging the large shapes and the large forms? So it's a great medicine for what we've been discussing earlier with regards to compositional and editing uh, experimentation and, and, and practice. Those are best practiced small. Those are best practiced very small uh, if, you, if you want to make the most out of it. Okay, that's, that's, that's really good. Okay. This, this at least I can subscribe to or I can relate to this uh, precisely because um, this lack of discipline that I, I've not been able to accomplish where I get very distracted by the by the um, how do you say by the specificity of a detail or something like that and then forget about the, the bigger picture literally so this idea of Of having smaller exercises this this sounds very interesting to me to at least 
tested to see uh, how how can help you to push in that direction at least make it small, make it fast and make it with very few colors. Then you're going to combine all three exercises. It's going to open up all your chakras. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, no, you can definitely do all of them together. You know, three colors, five by four, 20 minutes, oil, big brushes, rock and roll. You know, that's if you do, if you do four of these, it just takes you an hour and you're going to be a different painter. Just do four in a row with a stopwatch with three minutes of rest in between. You're gonna that one hour is gonna change you. Um, so I highly I recommend I highly recommend it. I will let you know. I will let you know if it works. <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds good. So this is for example, now specifically on, on my case, right? I am not I'm not uh, I'm not a, a painter. I am I have an interest in developing uh, 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 my 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 skills and the craft and 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 because I liked it in general, I always did. Uh, so I started by thinking, okay, maybe I'll try to reinforce my drawing first before I jump in into painting. However, uh, just for the holidays, I got as a gift, a few oil paints and uh, mm -hmm. like a few sets, like a starter set or something like this. So now I have these tools that I've been slightly afraid to jump into because I keep thinking, I don't have the basis, which, which is the, the basis is drawing or uh, composition in general or whatever. But so one of my question is like, is it justified to put this on hold or at some point e you can develop both things with, with, with different tools in this mm. case? So um, would, you, would you take that risk and jump into trying to develop, let's say composition in this case, as you say, small paintings uh, uh, using oil and, and brushes? Mm. You think it's a, it's a good, it's a good- I, uh, I always favor, I favor the bold approach. And I don't think, you know, when you're saying take the risk, right? Let's put things in perspective. A lot of people are worried about things that have no negative consequences if they fail miserably. You know, the whole negative concept, the entirety of the negative consequence would be, oh, goodness me, I've made a bad painting, right? That's, that should be a given. You know, let's put it this way. Nobody is going to go through life making no bad paintings. And all the people that you love and appreciate and admire have made insane amounts of bad paintings. Maybe they're burnt. Maybe they're in the trash can. I know I like tearing mine up. It's okay to make bad painting. It's necessary to make bad paintings. And people who tread carefully through this process, thinking that I need to just gradually build on small successes uh, and in so doing only improve very slowly and very gradually, it's not how it goes. It's more like the stock market. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, but hap but you know the trage trajectory over uh, an investment of 10 years, you're gonna see, oh, at the end of the day, you know the stock market was in our my favor, or whatever. But if you look at the graph, it went like crazy. It, yeah. it, it, it had a lot of fluctuations. So the process of learning is more like that. You know, one day you made something really successful, then for two days you've made terrible work, and then you make some more good work and the accumulation of knowledge is going to slowly alter the statistics in your favor, but very, very slowly. So first of all, there's, it's really senseless to be worried about making bad art. One should bless the day when you make a bad painting and say, ha, got that out of my system. Cause that's what it is. Got that out of my system. There was bound to be a bad painting this week. I'm glad it's today. Let's hope there's you know, a good painting tomorrow. So that, that's totally okay. Now, regarding whether or not I think a drawing foundation is, is beneficial. Yeah, I really, really, really do think a drawing foundation is, 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 is beneficial, but you can also practice your drawing foundations in oil, right? If you, if you work in oil and you just work in black and white or umber and white, you're essentially drawing with paint, uh, which has... It's, I guess if you compare it to charcoal, it, it, it compares favorably in numerous ways and unfavorably in other, in other ways. For example, um, 
the benefit of charcoal is the fact that you can erase, right? You can remove material uh, and basically kind of undo moves that you've done. In oil, that's way more difficult. So you have to learn how to work with, with the liquid material that, that behaves differently. You know, what you've, what you've made wet will not be dry this afternoon anymore. But then on the other hand, oil is a much richer medium than charcoal. You know, you can reach a much broader uh, spectrum of values. And after your piece is dry, you have more liberty to undo and repaint and, and kind of layer on top of it for way longer than charcoal could. So essentially, I would say they are more or less equal in their ability to develop your draftsmanship ability. So if you're starting with oil and you're limiting yourself to white and black or white and umber, you're essentially still developing your draftsmanship and your compositional abilities and therefore not in, you're not engaging in any kind of irresponsible learning uh, by, by any means. So if you feel like doing that, that's perfectly appropriate. I, I really don't think that that's a problem. If you want to jump in with all the colors, you know, it's not, it's not that I think it's a problem to make bad art. What I do think is a problem is to not learn enough. And I think when you're yeah. confronted with all the problems all at once, you, you end up learning less. And that's my only concern. I'm never concerned with anybody making bad artworks because that's just the artwork of the day. I'm concerned with people, and I meet these people all the time who say, you know, I've been learning for 20 years and I'm not progressing. I'm like, okay, like that's, a, that's an issue. You have to change how you're learning because a lot of people do exactly this. They put all the pigments on the palette. They just rock and roll into another painting adventure and whatever happens, happens. Like that's, a bad way to learn it's a bad way to learn so a, a, a better way to approach the learning process is to identify okay what are the key things that i want to understand better right now and how can i narrow the the scope of my project to address these points that are currently on my mind so nar narrowing and restriction in the service of learning uh is highly advised uh not 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 because i'm a I, I advocate for, for timid, timid behavior in, yeah, sure. in, in any way. Sure. No, no, this, this actually uh, is, it's also a, a question I have in, in your case, somebody like you, right? You are a great part of your time is doing your art and then you have your teaching and music and everything else you have going on. But for the, for the, for the craft, how much you still being an artist uh, decide, okay, I will do learning mm. and I will do my, my work because mm. I will, uh, uh, to me, they are easily separated. Mm. So I guess what you were saying before is like, now we are talking about things that will benefit the learning process. We are not mm. talking about developing uh, 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 your personal uh, work let's say mm -hmm. uh, so uh, for you in a case of somebody that who has been painting for a while who does does it for lo long periods of time compared to somebody like me for example who has very limited space to do it um, do you still dedicate time to to study to to mm. to, to push yourself uh, definitely yeah yeah that's a beautiful question actually and I feel like that First of all, this needs to be said uh, just kind of like a separate comment. When I teach, I learn. That's always the case. So the more time I spend demoing in front of groups of students, I'm reiterating these things that are very fundamental and very important and demonstrating them in a, in a way that is supposed to emphasize the importance of these specific exercises. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that when I teach, I actually find myself reminding myself of all these really important things. Like a lot of times I would do this kind of sketch and, and it, it turns out terrible. And I know for a fact that if I was in front of a group of 45 students, I would have nailed it. I would have nailed it. There's something about being alone in the studio that makes me more prone to mistakes because I don't have to 
make sure that I'm be, behave that I'm in my best uh, behave on my best behavior, right? If I'm if I'm in, in front of 45 students, I can't just decide to go off the rails and make a mess because people are counting on me uh, to 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 be disciplined, right? So a lot of these time, a lot of the time that I spend teaching is is actually now also the time that I spend practicing. It's it's almost it's it's almost they go hand in hand. Uh, and I think that's true for a lot of people who start doing teaching. They testify uh, that that this is this is also their learning. it's It's their own practice and exercises. Uh, but if I weren't teaching because I also have friends who don't do that, uh, the way that I like doing it is there's usually a time after an ambitious project of reflection mm-hmm. of reflection and thinking, okay, so this project, whatever, it's now at the client's home. They purchased it. They're happy with it. But, What could have been done better? You know, what am I happy with? And what am I unhappy with? And, and this reflection process, before, before you kind of start the next big thing, you have like a two, three week period of still thinking about that painting that you've been working on for a long time. That's a great time for learning, you know, going to the museum, thinking about the fact, okay, in that portrait that I did, I really wasn't happy with how I did the dress. You know, I did the best I could, but I want the next one to be better. You go to the museum, you look at some draperies, you do some sketches, and then you think, you know, the way that I dealt with the architecture of the room was not the best. You know, I would like it to be better next time. Then you go to the museum, you look at how other masters, you know, do, do their interiors, and then and, and you copy whatever, Hammershoy or whoever is your favorite. So I find that most of my learning kind of happens between ambitious projects when I'm reflecting on what I think could have been done better. Uh, because then you're, you're, you're really primed to listen because, because, you know, during the, during the process, you're like, leave me alone. I just need to make sure that I'm doing the best work that I can right now. You're so tunnel vision engulfed in the project. But once the project has left your studio, you're thinking, you know, if I have, if I had better skills in, in these, in these specific areas, that project would have been done better. Uh, and so I'm going to make sure that I cover these bases to, to, to give myself a higher likelihood of success next time. So that, that's the way it is for me. And then sometimes you're just uninspired to make your own work, which is artists go through that a lot. And I've, I've gone through many months of this recently because of COVID, because I just really like painting people from life. And I wasn't able to bring models into the studio. And I had a kind of kind of got sick of making still lifes for a while. And I was just, oh, man, like, what am I going to do with all my time? And that is the time that you can, you can devote to, to, to learning. You know, if you're mm-hmm. uninspired to make your own masterpieces or whatever it is you want to make, then take the time to, to improve. And that's exactly what I did. I basically set myself up with uh, three ambitious copies. I, I only ended up finishing one, but I did, I did other things along the way. But at least that was my plan. I said to myself, okay, I know that bringing people to sit for me to do a portrait paintings like I wanted to, and I have so many unfinished paintings that are, you know, Corona's fault that they have not been finished. Um, so I'm going to practice and, and, and learn the skills that when Corona ends, I'm going to be the better painter to, to, to do all these okay. projects, right? So, so just use, use those times of, of maybe uh, artistic, um, artistic block or, or circumstantial COVID block, whatever it is that's stopping you from making the art or, or, or when you're hungover from a, an ambitious project. There's, there's many times in an artist's work when you're not at present mixing colors for your painting. The, those, those days are best spent learning. Okay, cool, cool. Thank you for, for sharing <laughs> of, that. Of course. So if you don't mind, then I may have a, a question that is, because at the moment, for example, the things I've been, I've been wondering about and uh, about uh, uh, these basic exercises and things that can be done um, in my specific case, uh, pretty much I already, you gave me pretty good information at the moment for certain things. So I have an idea of what I would like to, to develop based on, on, on this comment. Um, so I'm quite happy and full of information for that. For that. So, and I have a lot of more questions personally that, that are, but just out of curiosity, and since we are touching a little bit in your personal work, I do, I, I do feel very curious in um, 
um, why you decided to do teaching like a, like uh, which is fantastic by the way it, it's not uh, not everybody that's good at something is good at teaching something so but you need to have not so not only the the the, the attitude but the hunger or or a desire to do this because it's not an easy it's not an easy task so so I'm very curious in, in how how come you decided to do this this uh, teaching in, in whether in all the different platforms that you have set up at the moment uh, um, which demands a lot of time also so what what pushed you in that mm. direction so I had um okay I love teaching. I really, really love teaching. And it's funny the way this might sound silly, right? But I really love painting, like looking at paintings, you know, enjoying great paintings is something that brings a lot of joy to my life. So my life is, is immediately improved if more people can paint well based on my standards, right? So if I'm surrounded by a group of students that every year that I spend with them, they make work that's a pleasure to behold. I'm enjoying it. Now, a big disadvantage that I have, uh, I guess, I, I guess not every artist feels this way, is, but I do. I just have a really hard time enjoying looking at my work. I don't look at my own work and enjoy it like I would look at another person's painting and enjoy it. You know, I... I feel accomplished when it's good, but you're, you're not going to catch me like staring at my own painting hanging on the living room wall. It's just, I, it's inaccessible to me. But when I stare at a student's work and the student has done exceptionally well and the painting is beautiful, I'm fulfilled in the way that I would if I go to a gallery and see other people's work. I just feel like other people's exceptional work is what's going to feel, what's going to fill that cultural requirement for me of like I need good art in my life and I need that good art to not be mine because my art just can't fill that hole for me so it just naturally drew me towards helping other people make the art that they want to make because I I only stand to benefit from it because if they make beautiful paintings then I get to look at them and if I get to look at beautiful paintings then I'm happy. You know, that's what makes me happy as a person to look at beautiful paintings. And, and if I want to, you know, if you talk about leaving, leaving a legacy, right. A lot of people deal with leaving a legacy, making sure that whatever it is that the catalog of all their works, you know, once they're no longer with us, that the, this catalog is, is the best. Okay. That's one way. And it'd be cool to, to make a lot of nice paintings that would look nice in a book, but I feel like there's a more profound legacy that you could make, which is advance the, the, the level of, of, of visual arts production globally, right? I don't even, you know, when I put uh, a video that I worked on very, you know, for many hours on Instagram, then everybody can watch it. And who knows, you know, if I, if I, can, if I can elevate the global uh, level of art making by even 1%, I feel like that's more significant than my pretty book. The book of Ken Goshen's whatever feels so like narcissistic and egocentric. And I, I just, I can't bring myself to care enough about what my ego is going to look like, whatever. I, I care about the world of art, you know, the world, all of us in this together. I want all of us to improve together and of course, I'm biased. I'm, the way I teach is I'm, I'm trying to get people to improve sure. with the certain things that I care about, right? But it just means that when, you know, hopefully 25 years from now, I'm going to look around and I'm going to see a much greater percentage of art that makes me happy. So I'm, I'm basically, I'm, I'm teaching because I'm working to, to advance my happiness, which stems from looking at art that I like. Sure. So you are planting a tree. Yes. And then, you know, and then, and then when I look at all these, these, these people, you know, 20 years from now, I'm going to look at these, these paintings and I would see fantastic, like way, hopefully I'm going to say way better than I could have ever done. That would make me really proud. I, I don't want to be 
you know, if I'm going to be the best painter, then, you know, culture, culture doesn't, the, the bar isn't high enough. You know, P culture can do better. I know culture as a whole can do way better than I could do in three lifetimes. And so I'm going to join that team, the team of advancing culture as a whole. Excellent. Well, you're doing great, I think. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying my best. I really am. <laughs> well, and it's a great time to do something like this because the reach that you can have now is incomparable with what uh, it was, uh, I don't know, 50 or even longer. Right? Certainly. Certainly. So take advantage of what it is and it's amazing. So we, I, I know we are like, I mean, I look at the other videos and whatever. And the other thing is we can choose, as you say, you are biased because you have, you're pushing towards the things that you find are important, but then people can say, I'm not interested about that. And they just put to the next, uh, an next post because there are millions and millions. And millions. Exactly. But uh, no, I think, I think it's great. I personally enjoy it, uh, obviously. Um, I do not have anything particularly more uh, to, to, uh, to ask uh, uh, you today, at least. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you want to jump into my take on how uh, physics and art are Beautiful. Alike. Oh my God, I, lo I would <laughs> love, I would love that. I just want to be mindful of your time because you initially said that you, yeah. you know, the, that you have time constraints. So making sure that you're not late for your more important things, <laughs> physics related <laughs> things, but, but please, yeah, let's, let's flip the script. So uh, I don't know where I'm going to, where I'm going to uh, start this conversation in terms of the editing, but just to make sure. So we have, we have Alex here with us, who's, who's an experimental physicist. Uh, and at the beginning of our conversation, he told me that art and physics are related in many ways. And I was very curious to hear how he, how, how he lays that theory out there. So I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you, Kenneth. It's, it's a pleasure to, to be chatting with you and sharing some of the things you have shared a lot and I appreciate that. So I will I hope that anything I say may be um, as interesting or, 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 or um, important to you. So the way I see it is there are many, many points where uh, science and art uh, uh, overlap and uh, mirror each other. Mm. So perhaps the, 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 the biggest one will be both are things that have been very necessary uh, uh, for, for, for the human race. So at some point we, today we were talking about this human part of you that relates you to art and, and painting in particular. Um, so these two things have been developing for a long, long time and they are still here. So that means they have something uh, that we need. Uh, uh, uh. Then one tends to think that all science are practical stuff and uh, and maybe people tend to think that art are things that are unpractical, like uh, a painting on the wall is not something that I can use for many things, right? Uh, but it's not true, like what we do, it depends on the different uh, variations of the areas that you may find in science and physics in my, in my specific uh, field. Uh, many of these things are unpractical as well. So you have people that spend a long, all their lives pursuing something that perhaps doesn't lead particularly to something, but, uh, but it does contribute in an overall. Uh, uh, uh. So this idea of somebody is spending hours and all their energy uh, pursuing something that may or may not have an application is something that I find it has a, a, a similar to, to similarity to, to, to what an artist may, uh, may feel uh, spending time uh, either painting or sculpting or studying uh, its craft. Mm, I also found, so at the beginning when I started the uh, college, I was, uh, at, at the beginning I wanted to go to arts and for many reasons I ended up going to, to physics. Uh, particularly because, so where I was living, there was no way to go to a college degree level for arts right mm. so the only way will have been to move somewhere else where economically it was not feasible for me to do that so i decided to go to something that was completely opposite 
So on purpose, I decided what is the most opposite thing I can I can I can come up with, and I decided to go to physics. And eventually, the more I spent time doing that, I realized that it was not as far as what I expected. You need a lot of um, uh, discipline. You need a, a lot of time uh, uh, developing your skills, your tools, your toolkits. So eventually you can actually do something. Uh, they tend to be very jealous, jealous um, careers. At the beginning, I tried to do both, but very suddenly I, I realized that you, you, need to, you need time for both of them. And uh, there was not enough time, at least for me in the day to, to carry out both. So there are jealous, both of them. <laughs> uh, and then uh, you need a lot of creativity also because, so you have all these bases that are uh, your tools, your math, or your hundred years old Newton laws or whatever you want. But at some point to do something that is new to push it or to flip it sometimes because uh, so in physics, we don't have many things that are very new either. The only thing we, we do is how we stack them up or flip them or use them. So uh, for this, you, you also need a degree of, of, of um, creativity. It is not only uh, uh, square thinking and following. If you follow the math, you will reach the result. Uh, depends on what you're doing. If it's a specific exercise or you are a very theoretician and solving something, uh, uh, a theory, then yes. But if you're doing something else, it is not exactly like that. So as I mentioned, I am an experimental phys physicist. So I, I work with physical things, right? Uh, but uh, I have an overlap with um, engineering perhaps. So mm -hmm. I do design of parts of the machine and stuff like that using the principles, but I need to imagine things and uh, even drawing things. So I find that is is the, also the, 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 the character of people are very similar. Mm. We tend to be very, uh, blind, blind side, uh, or like a horse, like right? very focused, very tunnel vision, and think about the other as very far away, and it's not related, and it doesn't have anything to do with us. But then, if you step back a little bit and you see the both and say, "Well, you are not that different. <laughs> you are telling me exactly the same thing that these other people have been doing." Um, so, and there are different characters, like in everything, each person is a, is, is a, is a world. So you also have this very um, elitist type of, of view where um, if you are not trained as a physicist, since you were essentially born out of your high school, then you are not allowed in a cer certain circle, which is not true. Mm -hmm. So the, the, this, I find that sometimes people that are academicians, whether it is science or art, tend to have this, this, this mindset, let's say. Mm. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess we could go in many examples in many directions, but I, I, I find uh, the main things that, that are important for me is the creativity and just the way that you try to um, use your toolbox essentially for doing something new with something that is already there. Interesting. So, I'm going to bring up something that um, feels to me like a, like a way in which these, these two fields are very, very different. And you tell me what you think. So mm -hmm. about art, a lot of the times people say that art has kind of gotten to the end of its logical conclusion right it's like it's it, it's been the most primordial then it got to the point where it's the most representational then it got to the point where it was the most abstract then it got to the point point that it's the most discursive and it's it's already kind of like hit all those major points and now in the world of art people have been asking the question now, what, what is left to do in art now that we've done all the possible things? Uh, and so art is kind of 
living in almost like in, in, in a wreckage of, of many golden ages of art where people have already hit hit the peaks whether it's or not your peak of abstraction is is Pollock or Rothko or the peak of representation being Eng or Rembrandt or whoever it is you like we're we're constantly looking backwards at golden ages that have done better than us and thinking what is left for us to do now that everything's been done and I feel like in physics it's it's not the case maybe I'm wrong but it feels like there's this major goal that's not yet been accomplished like the theory of everything unifying yeah. qu- quantum physics with with the Newtonian mechanics and so it, it 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 feels to me like physicists are are almost heroically trying to reach another golden age and some people spend their whole lifetimes in that pursuit and and not and, and you know falling flat and to me that feels like an, an incredibly brave, Uh, decision to be working in that field knowing that you potentially could be wasting your, your life and not not sure. getting answers to something that most certainly ha- if you ask me has an answer like one day this 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 is going to be reconciled one way or another it can't be that these equations don't line up um, what do you think about that like, I mean because I, I really do think sure. that physics is looking forward and art is looking backward like we've already done everything in arts but you You guys have work to do we're, we're counting on you we're waiting <laughs> <laughs> sure uh, no the way you, you put it it's I guess the short answer is I don't know and <laughs> nobody nobody knows and the reason why nobody knows is because it's true like you have this very massive goal that let's say is the star at the top of the Christmas tree but it, uh, it's not first of all it's not what everybody is aiming for but these are like You're talking about the, the ones that are far pushing the envelope and this will change completely the way we see the world and et cetera, et cetera. So the, perhaps one of the advantages is we have that carrot in front of us that is making us go that way. The truth is like, as you say, it's a risk in the sense like, yes, we want to, do, to reach that point and everything makes us think that We can reach it it is there however you need to remember that this what we do is try to decipher what is already there in nature and nature doesn't care what you want <laughs> so it doesn't matter how much we want it to happen if it's not there it's not there so there is a possibility that it, it will never be reconciled just because the way the universe is is not as beautiful as we think it is in terms of Of symmetries and uh, mathematics and whatever but um, we still have the hope right because everything we have found seems to have this harmony and these uh, uh, aesthetic, aesthetics of, of symmetries and all these things so you, you, you infer that it should be there so this is this is our narrative mm. so we are used to having uh, we need an end. right so it has to be a, a peak and an end but that's our human condition that doesn't mean it is, it is there so in that sense if we both are stuck in a, in, in, in or both fields are stuck in, 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 a, in a plateau forever it's yet to be seen mm. so there are many things like people are poking here and there to try to break through a different path and in this case I think this you can have a, 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 a similar sense with, with art what you are okay this is what we know but okay what about this specific thing that I'm not convinced about maybe there is something there and many of those are dead end but who knows this is the only way we have been found uh, new paths here and there both in, in science as, as in art is, 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 I guess this is really the human nature. And it may be that the thing is not linear with a beginning and an end, but it's mm. a cyclic or who knows. So, so this, is, this is, I guess, uh, many people that, I guess people that do art and they do uh, science and physics, they, most of them are not there uh, for the end goal, but they are for the right, you know? Mm. So we will see, maybe we are wasting our time, but I mean, if you have fun with it in between, and then sometimes something amazing comes out, right? Something 
an amazing masterpiece or something very useful for 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 the human race so absolutely that day we're happy but it's, this is this is just the process uh Wow. I'll let you know when, 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 when <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure I'm going to hear about it on the news. It's so <laughs> funny to me, though, that you think about the theory of everything, the unification as an end, because to me, uh, maybe it's something, you know, maybe it's my it's my artistic point of view. But to me, that's the beginning. This is like now we're done with the prologue. Right now. Now we know how the world works, you know, whether it be big <laughs> things or small things. And now we can kind of maybe try to see how we can put it to use you know whether it's like colonizing other planets like all 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 the wonderful things that are still available to us and all we're lacking is the knowledge uh which i i definitely believe the the all the all the barriers to to human flourishing and to human expansion and well-being they're in your field right the more we understand about physics the more we understand about the world the more we can kind of hack it to make sure that we have the best life that we we want to be living in and sure. as far as i'm concerned just understanding how to unify the way that large things behave and small things behave into a into a framework that makes sense feels to me like this has been the prologue of the human race you know the first 2,000 or 3,000 years of civilization, we did this. Now we have another, hopefully we can live sure. more, more thousands of years of actually putting that knowledge to incredible goals. Yes. Uh, so perhaps I'm more optimistic or, or at least no, maybe no, no, it's... No. <laughs> I, think, I think you're right. I think that, that you need to make the difference between uh, knowledge. So when I say the end, they say, okay, this is, we know everything we need to know, mm. which at the moment we know that we don't know everything that there is there to know. So once you reach that point, then you saturate the knowledge, right? The applications are endless. There is no way, there is no way that, yeah, this is, this. now it will depend on who comes next to have enough uh, um, creativity or drive to put all those things at use. Mm. So yeah, definitely that, that, that is endless. That there is the, it's not a sad story when I'm in it to the end. It's just meaning the end of the know-how, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, the we end are of not the manual. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How crazy is it to think that way? And are you are you persuaded by what I am, you know, looking at it from the outside, but being inquisitive and, and interested in the field? Sure. Currently, the I guess the most, um, I guess there's most hopes for it to come up with a solution the the, the theory of uh, the string theory side of things are you are you persuaded by that approach or do you think it's a waste of time no no i think this is this is because the thing is if if we reach that point then we complete the manual and as we say then the the the, the combinations are endless but if it's worth to try to complete the manual absolutely there is, there is no, there is no question about that. That, that we, that's what we need to do. That's as, as a race. This is, this is where we should always strive to, to improve, and not only, not only knowledge, also morally and globally, right? So, we, we are talking about a very specific thing. And when I say uh, uh, science, then people may think that you disregard everything else, which is now we know by meanings of measurement and all the different sciences, what happens to the climate, what happens to the animal and the impact that we have. And then you also have other things like, for example, yourself, you are a vegetarian, right? So you'd make vegan. a conscious decision. You're vegan, there you go. So even more brave. So you, you make conscious decision to, to, to but this, this doesn't, doesn't reach that point unless you have the knowledge, right? Because then it's just a, uh, just a, a, a belief, uh, uh, and there's a whole other discussion, which uh, it's also super interesting, and and, and um, uh, we sh we should spend time talking about uh, thinking about these things as as, as human beings in general. Uh, but if you are talking about science in a specific, uh, yeah, I think I think we need to do science the same way we need to do art. It's impossible. We if you if we are we are it's like a like a stool with three legs or something like that you remove one of them you're unstable yeah. so 
yeah, so all these things. So I think what makes us actually an interesting species is the, the, the completeness, the holistic view. You can pick very interesting things here and there, like your trade, my trade, or this and that. But what it really makes us what, what we are is, is, is the, the compilation of, of, of everything, mm. uh, good and bad. I like that. It, it, it touches, it touches on something that, um, you know, I, I do think a lot and, and talk a lot about things that I feel are built into us as people, because I feel like making successful art has to touch, has to touch something deep inside of us as what it, what it means to be, to be a person. And I think both art and science stem from something that is so quintessentially human and you don't really see in other care and in, in other animals, which is a feeling of continuous discomfort and dissatisfaction with our environment. It's this incredible situation where, you know, you put a cat somewhere, uh, like look around and say, okay, this is the most comfortable place to sit. I'm just going to sit there and, and, and generally be happy with my environment, right? Yes. A person is immediately going to say, oh man, like this could be way better. This is, this is definitely not as good as it can be. So let's put a painting on the wall and then let's develop some technological solution uh, for, for, for solving all our problems. It's like being a person is waking up to continuous and, 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 and unending feeling of dissatisfaction and thinking that things can be more efficient. Things can be more beautiful. Things can be more ethical. Things can be more. And this constant pursuit of, of things can, can always be more um, is, is really something that, that, is, that is very, very, very human. And also could be the reason why this kind of brings us back to our previous conversation, why we feel like we need to render every single detail, because we constantly want more, 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 more. But the problem is we, we don't always understand what brings that higher level that we're looking for. And, and, and that sometimes in our pursuit of better, you know, we have, we have to think simpler. So I think that, that, exactly. that, that creative, creative uh, approach is true, but probably both for science and, and for Absolutely. art. Absolutely. What, 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 a, what differentiates for me a good, a good scientist to, or a good engineer to uh, somebody that is still not there yet is, precisely being able to uh, discern between what's important. You can see everything there, but they say, okay, this is not important, this is not important. And then you need to simplify because the tools we have cannot solve everything. So it's, it, it has many parallels, I would think, to, from, from what we have been discussing, like uh, you have your set of brushes and there are certain things you're not gonna be able to do with that or your colors. So you need to know what you can drop and still have a meaningful thing. So th this, these are some, some of the parallels. And then particularly, personally, what I relate to what you were saying about contributing to, to this communal uh, um, uh, knowledge or, or um, um, in case of painting or whatever, I, I work particularly on a, on a big, big lab, right? So one of the things that I like about what I do is I, it's no way anybody, doesn't matter how smart you are, how skilled you are, you cannot do it by yourself. Mm. You depend on thousands of people, several countries that have joined together to push this. Otherwise, it's impossible. It's an impossible mm -hmm. task. So this sense of being part of something that can achieve something uh, that you cannot do by yourself or even with the test you're a team, you pick 10 of them, it's not going to be enough. Mm. So then uh, uh, this, this, this idea is something that I particularly feel very happy that to be part of. Uh, so particularly I work for the, uh, for CERN, for the European Center for- Oh, uh, no way. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's so, amazing. Yes. So that's, it's, it's, it just opens your mind Whoa. Uh, to this where People, this is this is like a, a flagship of something very human for me because it's many nations, many languages, many religions, many economies, everything, right? So you have from France to Israel to I don't know, many, 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 and and th this is something I I feel super proud and super um, 
happy, humble to, to be part of, right? That's so, amazing. I really, really love yes. it. It's, it's, such a, it's such a beautiful way of putting it. And also, you know, the, the degree to which fields that are so often ego-driven, I think, are, are brought to their, to their peak by, by sometimes by the people who are most humble. Uh, and I think that's, that's also important to, to, iter- to reiterate and, and to remember. Beautiful. I think, yeah. I think this is such a beautiful, positive note to, to end on. So maybe you can tell our listeners where they can find more about your work. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I mean, I have a few uh, like LinkedIn and, and, and social media. So my, la- my name is Alejandro Castilla. So that's C-A- C-A-S-P-I-L-L-A. As I mentioned uh, earlier to Ken, I am Mexican, so apologies for my, for my accent. My English is still paid sometime. Uh, so yeah, or just uh, go check out uh, the CERN site and see what they do. For example, they have very, very cool um, interactive tools so people can go and play with and, and stuff like that. They even have um, a fellowship for artists to spend some time uh, at CERN I think they spend one or two years, I'm not sure. And then they go around, they learn everything that people do, and then they need to do their own work. So these are super interesting things. That, uh, Where do I apply? <laughs> I'll send you a link. I'll send you Great. A link. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> Alex, thank you so much for taking the time for doing this. I really appreciate it. No, likewise. Thank you for joining me. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to see it grow, please take a moment to subscribe, rate it highly, and share it with a friend. If you'd like to become a supporter of the show and have access to exclusive content, please consider signing up as a patron at patreon.com slash Ken Goshen. For online lessons, please visit kengoshen.com slash lessons. Thanks again, and see you next time.